Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In the decades-old Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there are two dominant competing narratives. While Israel seeks to preserve its national security interests and settle some of the territories under its control, the Palestinians aspire to establish a state of their own and recall refugees and descendants thereof from the surrounding Arab countries with the aim of resettling them within Israel. In addition to the two dominant narratives, there is another more militant Palestinian narrative which denies Israel's right to exist. To discuss this topic, I'm joined here in the studio by Mr. Uh, Elhanan Miller, who is a researcher at the Forum for Regional Thinking. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV, uh, TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Roni Shaked, who is a researcher at the Truman Institute at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader explanation with regard to this topic. We set out to discuss the two competing narratives, but as you stated, we must delve on three rather than two, because there are two Palestinian entities right now, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, headed by Fatah, and uh, Hamas, which rules Gaza. Hamas is the more militant uh, organization with the more militant narrative. Now, the question is, the two dominant majorities, which seem to be uh, moderate, uh, at least relatively speaking, in Israel, because in Israel there are also extremists, but they are now marginal. And in Palestine, in the Palestinian community, the uh, majority headed by Mahmoud Abbas. Can the, re the narratives, which each of them holds, can they be reconciled? Is there any meeting of the minds? Can there be a grand compromise? And of course, this was the basis for the Oslo process. The belief that the moderates, um, in each uh, camp can find a way to bridge over the gaps. The last 25 years uh, have not proven that uh, this is right, but yet the moderates keep believing, keep dreaming of reconciling these narratives. Mr. Mito? I sometimes tell uh, Palestinians I speak to that their tragedy of their, their national movement was that they didn't have an Altelena moment in their history. In other words, when I say that, I mean this moment in Israeli history when this boat called Altelena carrying weapons for the pre-state militias was subdued and destroyed by the new leadership of Israel, by Ben-Gurion. Um, the tragedy of the Palestinians is that they don't have territorial contiguity, and therefore these two ethoses that are competing the ethos of Hamas, of resistance, and the ethos of the Palestinian Authority of statehood can't be reconciled. There's no decision. And therefore, they're stuck in the middle, unable to decide between these two ethoses. Dr. Shaked. With your permission, first of all, I want to talk about narrative. What is narrative? Narrative, it's not a history. It's not a release. History, it's imagined history. It's come to serve the the, the, the time that we are living and the future of the people. Narrative is giving the identity to the people, to the ethnic group. And without narrative, there is no future to every ethnic group. Now we have to understand something very important. The struggle or the conflict between conflict between two narrative that's what create conflict there is no conflict in the world not even in a garden in, in a in a kindergarten without without narrative and that's the problem i don't think that we have three narratives we have just two narrative the narrative of the palestinian people and i'm talking about the what we call the basic narrative of the palestinian people is very hegemonic dominated by all the people, even by Hamas. And what I, what I want to wanna say here, they believe in their history, their place here in this country, on this land, and they are competing to another, uh, to, to another uh, a, a narrative. The narrative of the Israeli people is, again, it's, that's what create here the conflict. The Israelis said we, ha we are here because God promised this land to us and therefore we came in all, the, all over the years. Here is the archaeology and archaeology is, is, uh, is built in order to serve the, the, the narrative. Here we have the archaeology, here we have the history and so and so. So that's our land. The Palestinians said, no, we are the Canaanite. We came here before you, the Palestinian, the, the Israeli people, and then you came here. The Zionist movement is colonialist, imperialist, 
a group that came here to live in, on, on our land, and they just took the land from us, from our future. And that's what makes the conflict, and that's why we have a conflict. Now, to bridge the two conflicts, that's going to be peace. When it's going to be, I don't know, because I don't believe that there is a way when religious is playing a lot of part, a big part in this conflict, and I'm talking about the Jewish religious and the, also the Muslim, Palestinian religious. And both of them are making all their efforts to, to, to strengthen their narrative. Nevertheless, when we're talking about narratives, uh, uh, it's not based on fiction per se. It's based on the foundation of uh, reality and history, for that matter, that uh, we are able to see two narratives colliding. And of course, it creates uh, somewhat of a conflict, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, a conflict of war and other times a more diplomatic uh, kind. In this situation now, we see more and more uh, two narratives uh, emerging, if you will, and uh, going back to what you said about the Palestinian Authority dominating the Palestinian narrative, um, the fact of the matter is 12 years ago, the Islamist Hamas organization was the one who won the election with uh, the declaration that the resistance will be the forefront of their aspiration to realize the future of this uh, uh, ongoing battle between Israel and the Palestinians. So a couple of points uh, here. Uh, just elaborating on what uh, Ronnie just said regarding the term narrative. A narrative is a story one tells oneself. Of course, others too are become the audience to this story. The Bible is a narrative. Uh, it is not intended uh, to be uh, factual. Uh, there have been, of course, uh, many legends, many sagas, many tales, and of course, some of them uh, have uh, historical uh, foundation, but it doesn't have to be 100% uh, accurate. So the story that the Israelis have been telling themselves and the story that the Palestinians have been telling themselves collide because um, you can't have a justice for one side or 100% justice for one side and zero justice for the other. And the test of statesmanship is to find the practical means, even though the narrative that you, my, my uh, interlocutor, um, are telling me, you may be right, but let's proceed from here so that future generations can coexist, can live, without going back uh, at all times to what happened 2,000 years ago, 140 years ago. We are not never going uh, to come out of this uh, abyss uh, if this is uh, what we are going to do. And um, at Oslo 25 years ago, what uh, the uh, what Rabin and Arafat tried to do was uh, try a gradual process in which the two sides will familiarize, familiarize themselves not only with the narratives, but also with actual people, actual events, actual life on the ground. It failed in many respects and this is not uh, the uh, time or place to, to uh, elaborate, but uh, it is not yet doomed. Uh, it can be salvaged if um, one finds uh, the way they did in South Africa. If one finds the right way to uh, get along and uh, agree that yes, there were injustices in the past, but now we must try to, buy, to build a common future. Two comments on that. First of all, uh, I see the Bible as factual 100%, so that's okay. uh, a different Fine. understanding. Okay. And uh, it's, of course, a foundation of faith and belief uh, sure. with uh, uh, various okay. archaeological findings to uh, that. And justice, of course, the matter of justice is indeed a matter of perspective and uh, needs to be handled as such. Uh, Mr. Miller, how do you perceive the ongoing situation of this conflicting narratives? Well, I think um, continuing from what um, Amir said, um, I think history has shown that leaders who are interested in stalling peace negotiations and reconciliation have tried more to stick to the narratives uh, and not move away from them. In other words, recognizing that you're always in the narrative means that you can't really reconcile with the other side because the narratives collide. 
Now, it's one thing to familiarize yourself with the other's narrative and know it. It's, the other, it's another to agree with it. And I don't think Oslo tried to make the sides agree to each other's narrative. What today the leaders are doing is asking the other side to accept the narrative or the ethos of, of our side. And they're doing that with a very intentional purpose of blocking progress. Because when Netanyahu wants the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, that's something that for whatever reason, Palestinians can't do. And when the Palestinians want the Israelis to recognize the injustices of 48 and accept the right of return in principle, that's also something that Israelis can't do. So being stuck in these foundational narratives is something that obstructs progress. It doesn't help progress move forward. Dr. Shaked, I'd like to ask you with regard to the Palestinian narrative uh, per se. Uh, when we're talking about the Palestinian narrative, it's not a unified narrative at this moment, considering the fact that there is uh, a very deep dispute between Hamas and uh, the Fatah factions, and it's an ongoing dispute that doesn't show a lot of uh, promise about resolving it in the near future. To what degree are they aligned on the position, or is it actually just a battle over control? First of all, as I said before, Hamas and also the PLO or the people in the United States, Palestinians in the United States, in Egypt, in Damascus, or in the West Bank, are believe in the same in the same narrative, the narrative of the Palestinian people, it's their identity. That's what we have to understand. And without it, they are not going to, to leave. We have to understand also what it is a collective memory of the Palestinians. The collective memory is connected to, the, to their narrative, especially to the Nakba. The Nakba is a key point in order to understand the Palestinian people and their behavior today not just the Nakba, but also the Naksa. The Naksa, it's a 1967 war. And they, all today, they are all gathering all around the, 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 the narrative, how they are doing it. First of all, the textbook, the textbook in Gaza of Hamas and the textbook here in Ramallah or in Jerusalem is the same textbook, the same story about the Jewish people, the same story about colonialism, the same story about what the Jews did in the, during the during the Nakba. Nothing is nothing is there is no difference between Hamas and and the and the, and the Palestinian authority here in this place. The, sto the the songs that they are singing. The right of return that now what they are making in Gaza, they are all using the the the, the narrative and the collective memory of the of the Nakba in order to promote the, the demonstrations in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And it's again, it's the same story in the West Bank in in and in Hamas. But in, the, in, in Hamas, because they are in struggle or in conflict or a war with Israel, it's much more stronger than in the West Bank. But I think that it's, it is the same thing and the same, the, same, the same story, the same narrative is told in Balata and in Gaza. There is no, no difference. So if and there is another, no difference, the most one, important one moment, thing, Dr. Shaked. One ju moment. Just, just to add something very important. And the, politi the, the politics on the both sides are using the narrative as a political resource. Obviously, the political systems are the ones who of decide course. what kind of education they provide to their people. Nevertheless, when we're talking about the, the Nakba, as you put it, uh, which is defined in Israel as independence rather than uh, the Arabic word for catastrophe, the perception of the Palestinian people and the foundation that Israel's inception in 1948 was a catastrophe, can that bring about a solution to uh, actually recon reconcile between the Palestinian side to the Israeli side, or should there be a shift of moving forward to the future? The minute that we have so many refugees, the minute that we have here UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Work Agency, that they are using the, 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 the narrative of the Palestinian in order to exist, the minute that all the people really believe that they have the right to go back to their homeland, even with a with a political solution of of the, of a, of a two state solution, they said, okay, let's make solution political solution, but we have the right to go back to our land. The minute that we have it, and it's so strong, we can't understand it. I think that we know details, but we don't understand the details. We don't understand the way that they are singing in the kindergarten, the way that they are teaching in uh, the, the, the boys and girls in high school. The songs, for example, Muhammad Asaf, the, the Arab idol, 
you, I don't know if you know if you, you I'm, I'm sure that you heard his songs. What mm -hmm. he's talking, he's talking about the kofia. He's talking about the the, the bridge for the bridge of uh, going back uh, to the, of the right of return. He's talking about going back to our land to build whole Palestine. That is the song. And the songs and kindergarten and textbook is much more stronger than Bibi Netanyahu or Abu Mazen. Mr. And, Owen, and I... it's also the key. The key to the old house. The key which to the old house that they are holding here today. So that's if, if we're hearing time and again that the the ongoing aspirations of the Palestinian people are on the one hand declared to be uh, establishing a state on the 1967 borders, but uh, this seems to be more and more a minority opinion with more and more people actually declaring, including the son of uh, Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas, uh, declaring that, no, we don't want a two-state solution. We want a one state uh, for two peoples. We want to uh, be part of whether it's Israel or in the future Palestinian state. We, we see also more and more the, the narrative in the ground, in the textbooks and so on, calling and still aspiring to have one Palestinian state, not uh, living side by side with Israel. These may be expressions of uh, despair, but there is a difference between purity and politics. Take two political leaders, Menachem Begin, when he was the leader of a small party, Herut, had... Um, as his uh, emblem, as his symbol, both sides of the Jordan River. Uh, his narrative aspired uh, to Israeli control over the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. In order to get to power, he had to compromise and uh, give up this dream, which wasn't practical, so he emerged with another party, the Liberal Party, and eventually, after 30 years in opposition, he reached power. And then he compromised with Egypt, even though earlier his narrative included the control of the Sinai Desert too. Now take Yasser Arafat. He started out with a maximalist narrative. And then because of the realities of world politics, because he knew that he had to get some American support, some United Nations support, he came up with, with a new theory of uh, the uh, stages doctrine. Let's compromise with Israel, but you, my people, I'm telling you, it is only the first uh, stage. But eventually, eventually, uh, he came around to what you uh, mentioned, uh, recognizing Israel within the 1967 borders. From a political the, point of view, not from the narrative point yes, of view. Yes, yeah, mm. but the, prob the problem is <coughs> the narratives and the politics are not synchronized. When the Palestinians... Belatedly, they should have done it in 1947, they didn't. But belatedly, and not even in 1967. But when in 1987 or 88 or 89, doesn't really matter. When they finally recognized Israel in the 1949 to 67 borders, Israel had another vision already uh, with control and settlement in the territories which it acquired in the 1967 war. So there's never a right time when both leaders of Israel and Palestine meet uh, like Begin and Sadat did and sign a compromise which brings them to final peace. And this is actually very interesting. Mr. Miller, as somebody who is also now on his journey to become a rabbi uh, uh, among Jews, to what degree uh, does the foundation of the state of Israel, which is founded also in, in biblical uh, uh, aspects, and, and that is the core principle for this uh, uh, establishment of the Jewish state, how can Israel relinquish um, the Judea and Samaria? Of course, uh, we call it the West Bank also because uh, the Jordan Valley, uh, uh, Valley also constitutes part of this, which is not part of Judea nor Samaria. How can it relinquish control over those two territories, considering the fact that that is the same foundation that uh, uh, brought about the establishment of the state of Israel to start with? Well, I think the simple answer is that most Israeli Jews don't really believe that their claim to the land is based in the Bible as it literally would be understood in that way. I think from the early times of Zionism, it saw it more as a historic fact that Jews lived in this land and wanted to come back rather than the God-given promise for the entire land. If most Jews believed in that 
interpretation, then it would be very, very hard to relinquish it. I think today the argumentation that the Prime Minister of Israel is making is more a security argument rather oh, than a religious, security? rather than a biblical uh, religious argument. I think, and that's the one that it, uh, convinces most Israelis today is the security uh, risks. Um, but I want to continue from what Amir said. The same pragmatism that Amir diagnosed with uh, the PLO is, I think, now beginning to happen with Hamas, again, belatedly. I recently interviewed a Hamas leader, a very senior leader named Hussam Badran, and he told me when I asked him about the ideology, he said, we're not so different from the Israeli right. In other words, there's the utopia, there's the, uh, the, the ideal of the entire land, and we're the same way. There's this final vision. Um, and then there's the reality. And that's what brought us, he said, to recognize Israel on the 1967 borders. It's not a full recognition. It's not a wholehearted recognition that we'd want to see. But there's the beginning of an understanding that there's a realpolitik and then there's a utopia. And narratives belong to the re- utopia field. And still leaders can deal within the realpolitik. Dr. Shaked, do you believe that the two narratives uh, will continue to collide with one another, or is there a way out of this whole situation? I'm so sorry that because, as I said, because of the waves of religious on the both side, we are going to continue to fight, and there's going to be a struggle between the two, uh, the two uh, narratives. And struggle and fight between two narratives, it's not less dangerous than weapon. That's what I want to say. You have to understand one thing. I know that everybody knows that the narrative is not a static thing. It changes. Begin change it, Arafat change it a little bit. They are changing it according to the situation, according to the political needs, and they are changing it and they are rebuilding it again and again. But all the time now, especially those days when we have conflict, I don't think that somebody is going to say it I'm not going to use the narrative. On the contrary, they are using the narrative in order to strengthen their position on the both sides and in order to gain more political power against the other side. And uh, what's happened here? The, on the Israeli side, the, the narrative, the Israeli narrative is very strong. Although in the 80s, there was some new historian who tried to change the narrative of the Nakba. I'm talking about Avi Shleim and all, and, and all the others, even Benny Morris, but now he changed his, his mind. But uh, and the, on the other side, in the Palestinian uh, side, the narrative is very hegemonic, very, very hegemonic and con- consensually in the, the, in, in the, in, in, in the, among the Palestinians. And it's very hard to change it. And all the time when we we'll, when we'll have conflict we, and we we'll, we are not going to have some kind of understanding and some kind of uh, change, changing the the situation here the narrative is going to play a very dangerous i'd like to touch on in another element of the narrative um and that is uh, the fact that uh, still hamas uh, remains the major uh, party and according to the polls also the major holder for future elections among Palestinians when uh, we consider the different uh, opportunities for the Palestinians for the future. They hold a very uh, staunch uh, uh, belief in the narrative of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is another narrative, uh, uh, a more global one uh, than the uh, local Palestinian one. To what degree does the one intertwine with the other? In Israel, there is a famous political slogan, only Likud could which means that Likud, the right-wing bloc, if they make a concession, if the right-wing makes a concession, the public will resign itself to it. It will mean that they fought hard, and this is the best that could be achieved for Israel, so so be it. If Hamas could make a concession, which Fatah could not, because because their uh, ideal of resistance, if they finally decide or Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, it's the same uh, resistance uh, ideology. If they do it, that's fine. Now, um, what we have with the Israelis and Palestinians are two scorpions in a bottle. If left to their own devices, there can be no compromise because of what we talked about here, the geographic, demographic, and religious dimensions of the conflict. And this is why, because the Americans and others, but mostly the Americans, when they intervene, when they are the referee, there is some hope. Because 
we, what we saw uh, between Israel and Egypt was that the superpowers intervened when there was a danger of a superpower collision because of what is happening in the Middle East. As long as the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis does not endanger other powers, they will let it at least simmer. They, they may not like a full-fledged war, but they don't really care. Only when it will be perceived as endangering their interests, they would intervene and they can force a solution of the conflict. Mr. Milo? You asked about Hamas as part of uh, the, the larger Muslim Brotherhood movement, and I think it's meaningful um, because in the larger Arab world, the Muslim Brotherhood has weakened significantly in the last five or six years. And that has, I think, added to the uh, ability of Hamas to be pragmatic, at least in the near future. Um, but Hamas has also shown its ability to act independently as a national player, not just bound by regional uh, alliances. Um, yes, influenced by Islamic ideology, by the ideology that Islam should govern politics. But that doesn't mean that it's bound by the prisoning of, let's say, President Morsi in Egypt. Um, Hamas will lower its head for the time being um, and will adapt. Whether Israel can live with this medium term change, that's a different question. Sometimes medium agreements and deals have a dynamic that they become permanent. And that's a decision Israel needs to make. May, may I add for a second? Uh, unfortunately, we're no, uh, running out I'm, of time. I'm giving up my, my uh, <laughs> Just closing to say, statement. Hamas, like the Palestinian Authority, is a political movement. It's not, it's, it doesn't have any connected to, to connection to the narrative. The narrative belongs to the people. The narrative belongs to the collective memory of the people. The, 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 the narrative belongs to the future of the people. They are political parties. Therefore, they can use it. They can use it to, 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 to change it or to make it, to minimize it or to, or to strengthen it, but not to change it and not to take it out from nevertheless if they're the major party among the Palestinians they uh, the Palestinian narrative at least is perceived as uh, being able to receive the only solution by Hamas's uh, uh, aspirations uh, no, or at I, least I, declarations. I, I, I don't say that I say that there is a way to find political solution but not solution to the mm. narrative okay. narrative is justice first of all the, the war of justice, and that's... Mr. Owen, last sentence. Well, if the Palestinians want to unite the Israelis, they have to insist on the right of return because even moderate Israelis will never agree to it. But we have been talking about the main body of the text of the narrative. There are also footnotes. For instance, we always get our people back. They want their prisoners. We want the remains of our soldiers and our prisoners. This is something that, of course, will be perpetuated for a longer period of time. But this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Mr. Elchanan Miller, Mr. Amir Owen, and Dr. Roni Shaket for coming today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem. <laughs>